Good evening and welcome to the first Japan Brazil panel of the year. This event is organized by the Japan House São Paulo and the School of International Relations at Fundação Getúlio Vargas to discuss some of the main matters in the international agenda, bringing together specialists from both countries. Tonight, the topic of discussion is climate change through the lenses of global governance and international relations. We're delighted to introduce our panelists who kindly accepted our invitation to share their extensive experience on the subject with us. Mrs. Yukari Takamura is a professor at the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo, and she joins us from Japan. And Mr. Eduardo Viola is professor at the Institute of International Relations at the University of Brasilia. It is part of our protocol to highlight that all statements expressed during this event exclusively represent personal opinion and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. Also, all present here agreed to participate and have consented to be recorded on this broadcast, which will be later posted on FGV's official channels. The audience can send us questions during the entire event through the Slido platform. You can access it in the event description. After the expositions, we have a few minutes to discuss and answer the questions. Unfortunately, Professor Dr. Pedro Bricis, coordinator of this project, was unable to join us tonight due to some technical issues, but I will represent him as best as possible. To kickstart our panel, I'll give the floor to Professor Takamura from the University of Tokyo. Her research focuses on legal and governance issues related to multilateral environmental agreements, as well as the regulation and politics of climate and energy. She has served as one of 10 experts in the meeting established under the Prime Minister to develop the Japanese long-term strategy for decarbonization, which was approved by the Cabinet and submitted to the United Nations in 2019. In addition to the long-time collaboration with the United Nations Environmental Program, she serves as a member of the Advisory Group on Climate Change and Sustainable Development at the Asian Development Bank. Thank you very much, and it is our pleasure, Professor Takamura. Thank you. Thank you, Luana. Uh, it's a great pleasure of me to uh, join in the, this uh, Japan project panel organized of the School of the International Relation, uh, Relations and FGB. So the, uh, I, I think I tried to share the slides just a minute. I hope you can see this slide. Okay. So, uh, the screen is dark now. Oh, really? Seeing it before. It's not really work then. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to then again. Yes. How is it's coming? We can you see. It. Yes, you can see. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the uh, uh, this time I, I I'm going to talk about the climate change policy after the Paris Agreement. I think I, I was told that the uh, most of the students have uh, you know the. Uh, basic knowledge about the climate change uh, policy, but uh, I think I like to then focus on the uh, what is um, recent development in the climate change policy after the Paris Agreement. So, uh, uh, but still, the uh, maybe it is better to rebut, I mean, debut the development of, of the history of international climate policy. As you know, that the after establishment of the international governmental panel on climate change, the IPCC, which are a scientific body to feed the, the uh, climate uh, related knowledge into the policy uh, process. So the uh, first convention was adopted in 1992, as you know, that in, uh, you know, the, just after the Rio summit, a uh, summit uh, held in the Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The first convention is UN, uh, United Nations Framework Convention, Climate Change. And then the, after the second assessment report of IPCC, the, we had the Kyoto Protocol adopted in 1997. That is the second 
uh, international treaty. And then the the uh, things uh, you know evolved. Finally, the we had the uh, Paris Agreement in 2015. Then the that is the three uh, convention treaties related in relate directly related to the climate change. So the I I I I I think that the Kyoto Protocol is quite well known. The it provides for the quantified emission target for developed countries. And it provides for also the market mechanism called the Kyoto Mechanism. Maybe you might know that Green Development Mechanism, CDM. So the, this uh, Kyoto Protocol actually was the, the uh, you know, evolved into the 2015 Paris Agreement. So now the, we count uh, for the 189 countries, including the United States and the uh, EU ratified. So the what is the main feature of the Paris Agreement? Uh, main feature, of course, the it's a uh, twenty nine article. It, it was the how can I say the Paris Agreement is composed of twenty nine articles. But I, I I just show you here that the uh, several point. But uh, since the uh, due to time constraint, uh, I like to focus uh, uh, especially two point. Uh, first main feature is, is that the Paris Agreement provide for clear long-term goal for decarbonization. Article 2.1 uh, provide for uh, provide that the uh, uh, holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degree and uh, pursuing effort to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree above the industrial level. Uh, this scale of the and the speed of decarbonization correspond to the net zero emission or decarbonization in the second half of this century, based uh, based on the most scientific most recent scientific knowledge that the if we wish to achieve 1.5 degree target under the Paris Agreement, we need to uh, reduce our emission to zero by 2050. Um, in order to achieve such a long-term goal uh, for decarbonization under the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, Paris Agreement actually the uh, you know designed some of the institutional uh, uh, you know device. One is the uh, mitigation commitment, I mean reduction commitment for all countries. But this target is set by uh, a voluntary basis. So the, each country uh, provide, uh, prepare, and uh, submit its own target uh, internationally and explain what is the, the, the reason why that they, uh, you know, the, the, they put this kind of target. Um, this is the current and nationally determined contribution that is a current national target but uh, I think some of some of country and the region has already announced that they updated for instance I think the EU and China is already submitted a new updated NDC uh, it's I mean the national target but uh, I think I, I know that Brazil is the one of that the you know listed here but uh, the, I, I, I think the one of the issue is uh, related to the Paris Agreement is that the, even though the country implemented perfectly its own target, it, it, it the, these uh, you know the accumulated level of reduction will not achieve the long term goal. We have a large large gap between uh, the our current level of action, climate action, and target and uh, uh, long-term goal pathway, uh, pathway toward long-term goal, uh, that such as a 1.5 and a well, well below two degree target. So uh, to tackle this, you know, effectiveness problem, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement provide for the five years cycle, cycled a uh, larger type of mechanism. Every five years, each country have to submit its own target, uh, hopefully updated and uh, raise the level of emission. 
So every five years, this kind of, you know, ratchet up happen, then the, uh, hopefully we could achieve the long-term goal for decarbonization under the Paris Agreement. So I, I think I'm going to share my slide after the presentation of this event, so that through this, you know, the uh, School of International Relations, but uh, that is uh, the, some kind of comparison between the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. I think you can see that, uh, of course, both are legally binding, but uh, for instance, the coverage of reduction commitment taker are different, as I said, and also nature of commitment and target setting approaches are, you know, quite, uh, you know, the, uh, quite a different. So, um, I move on to the, uh, you know, second uh, topic, or second, you know, the point that I have to, I like to say is that the, this clear long-term goal uh, provided uh, for or in the Paris Agreement it had a quite a significant impact of the all international regime because see, that's got, provide a guidance for the each country's policy direction. Uh, you might know that the Japan is a one country that announced that they wish to achieve the net zero emission by 2050. So uh, we now count the more than 120 countries plus European Union uh, join in this kind of 25 decarbonization uh, goal. And uh, not, uh, in addition to such a national commitment or national goal, uh, this long-term goal under the Paris Agreement uh, provide a guidance for other international regimes uh, maybe we, some scholars say that it's kind of orchestration, orchestration in global climate governance. For instance, the, uh, you can see that International Civil Aviation Organization called ICAO, now the, uh, they, uh, they are taking, uh, preparing for the taking the action uh, in uh, corresponding to the decarbonization goal under the Paris Agreement. And also the same for the International Maritime Organization and the, the uh, Montreal Protocol to tackle the ozone dep uh, depleting ozone layer is also tackling uh, or, or, or strengthening the action, especially toward the, the uh, uh, hydrofluorocarbon, which is one of the potent greenhouse gases. Um, as I already said that the uh, Japan uh, announced that the, the its own goal to achieve the net zero uh, emission by 2050 uh, it, 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 it was happened last October by the prime minister by, by the in the prime minister's announcement on the first his policy speech. But as I said, that it's not only Japan but also the more than 120 countries are joining. And uh, it, it's, I think it's, it's getting uh, some kind of de facto uh, international goal or, or in terms of the climate change. Uh, maybe you can see a, a little bit more detail here, the uh, you know, climate policy by the some countries. Uh, EU, as I said, that already the, uh, they have a target, a long-term goal of the cli uh, climate neutrality by 2050. They already updated its 2030 national target uh, from the four, at least 40% below 1990 to the 55% below 1990. UK is quite sane, uh, but uh, its target is now the six, uh, its target, I mean, 2030 target is now the 68 reduction target, uh, you know, the, uh, by 2030. U.S., you know, the, uh, they just, uh, the Biden administration started quite an aggressive climate policy. Uh, they already announced a net zero emission by 2050 and also carbon-free electricity by 2030 with $2 trillion of investment in the infrastructure, especially in green energy. And China as well, and uh, China is now the first, uh, world first country of, in terms of renewable, but they uh, already announced that the peak in emission, its emission before 2030 and achieving, uh, toward achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. So the, you can see 
that the long-term goal of, of the Paris Agreement actually inform the, these country to, uh, you know, the uh, formulate and implement climate policy in its own uh, jurisdiction. So, why such kind of move happening? I, I think the uh, maybe the one point, one driver, driving force is that unfortunately, climate related disaster have seen increasing. So the uh, actually in Japan, it's caused a gigantic economic loss already. Uh, for instance, the more than one trillion yen of payment uh, done, has been done respectively 2018 and 2019 by Japanese insurance companies due to the climate related disasters. And uh, also local authority are moving toward the uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. I think just to show the some kind of climate related disaster in Japan, it's a table of the showing that how much gigantic the economic loss due to climate disaster. The maybe I rather uh, I'd like to for, uh, highlight that the second driving force is actually coming from business sector. Um, here I put some example, but the Japan. Japan Association of the Corporate Executive uh, asked the government to take policy uh, to increase the, the, the uh, renewable share up to 40%, currently actually the around the 20%, and it's a doubling uh, target by 2030. Uh, you know, the too old, the, uh, as I think, the, I show that's the reason why the business are actually moving toward maybe the very, very fast, even compared to the government. That the example of the active climate action on the part of business is here the, uh, under the uh, initiative of Science Best Target Initiative. It is a global initiative. Uh, you know, this uh, initiative is actually certified the, 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 com the companies uh, uh, with the Paris uh, Agreement, you know, consistent goal. Uh, uh, that means that the country, they uh, certify companies uh, of of its goal of goal or, or in which of goal is in line with the level of decarbonization goal under the Paris Agreement. Now we count for the more than one thousand two hundred. Uh, this is a list of Japanese company already committed. You can see that quite some, some company name, a Japanese company names might be familiar with you, like a Sony and Panasonic. And, uh, you know, this, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, you know, you can see that the list of representative, I mean, the Japanese representative companies here. Uh, also the Toyota and uh, uh, some big, uh, you know, the oil and uh, electricity company is also joining to this 20, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. In two, the one of the most important tool to achieve it is renewable energy. So the, uh, this is an initiative coming from the business sector as well as a renewable 100 initiative. Um, Big global company is now joining to this initi initiative, including the 50 Japanese company. Again, the, like Sony and uh, Asahi and uh, it, 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 many, many Japanese, you know, the uh, quite a well-known global corporation is joining to the, uh, do their business uh, with the 100% renewable electricity. Why this move coming as a one, Great reason is the, this pressure coming from the supply chain. I pick up one example from the uh, big IT platform company, Microsoft. Microsoft just announced that the Climate Moonshot Initiative uh, last year. Uh, it, of course, their action is quite ambitious, but uh, I, I just highlight here that the they already almost, you know, the uh, decarbonize their businesses, especially by using renewable energy. But uh, now their focus move on to the, their, uh, the emission from the supply chain. 
So for instance, example of the Microsoft show that the Microsoft wish to reduce scope three emission. Scope three emission means that the emission from the its supply chain, I mean supply chain of the Microsoft, for instance, if Microsoft wish to uh, do their business with other companies, partners, they wish to reduce emission from these uh, partner companies. So they have a clear target that they uh, reduce the emission of partner company by more than half by 2030. For doing so, they uh, start this year new procurement processes and to enable, incentivize its uh, supplier of Microsoft to reduce their emissions. So the same happened with Apple. Uh, Apple wished to you know, do their business all, all over the business by renewable energy. So they uh, ask, they request a supplier of, of my Apple to do uh, their business by renewable 100. So the last point that I like to highlight is that the driver for the change in the behavior, business behavior come from financial institution. Now the investor and financial institution request the company to disclose climate-related risk covering the whole supply chain of companies. And based on this information, they invest uh, according to the ESG factors, uh, often called ESG investment. E is environment, S is social, and G is corporate governance. So the, uh, based on this information related to ESG, the investor uh, actively invest in these companies which are strong with these ESG factors. So the amount of investment is increasing very quickly. And, uh, 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 you know, the, they actually engage company to do uh, the ESG activities. Uh, you know, the, especially uh, focusing on climate change. So the, uh, in, how can I say, they convince the company to do more aggressive action in their business, especially in, the, uh, in relation to the climate change. So the uh, Sony now, uh, I, I think the uh, Japanese company is quite uh, vulnerable uh, in that sense because the uh, our uh, you know the uh, our in our jurisdiction we have sometimes difficulty in procuring the renewable energy. Sometimes high, sometimes we lack volume. So the Sony actually uh, you know the somehow announced that the if they could not procure renewable more easily, they have to, they maybe have to go out from Japan because the, the all, many supplier, uh, many company, partner company uh, uh, was the, uh, working with Sony, uh, request Sony to decarbonize and uh, do business with the renewable. If they couldn't, they lose a business opportunity, uh, uh, you know, the West this uh, business partner. Japan is uh, one of the countries which uh, have a risk facing such situation uh, after the United States. So one, the reason why is that Japan is uh, one of the country with the highest emission intensity in terms of electricity, so that's the how to decarbonize our electricity or power system is one of the very important factor to the, the uh, you know improve uh, the uh, competitiveness of Japanese you know the companies. So uh, to end, I think I, I I like to finish. Maybe I could uh, 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 lap up here. Now we see the, some changing approach in global climate governance because the, uh, even compared to the Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement presents a long-term goal, clear long-term goal, I mean vision for the future society, the carbonized society, because that's, uh, you know, the facilitate the understanding of the scale of program, climate change, and identify challenges. That is not only for government, but also the international, how to say, the global, other global institutions, and also the, the private sector. 
uh, because the uh, change uh, tackling climate change need uh, uh, action and uh, uh, investment on the part of private sector. Then how to incentivize innovation, investment, uh, action by state, not only state, by non-state actors. So for doing so under the Paris Agreement, not only uh, the country taking the action, but also the country, uh, uh, you know, the try to internalize and the mainstream climate related risk consideration in business strategy itself and this business decision making through climate related financial disclosure and uh, impacted by investors. And uh, uh, it the one of the big uh, incentive come from supply chain because the uh, supplier uh, wish to change the supplier its supplier's behavior. I mean, business wish to change its supplier's behavior, and then the company have to change its behavior uh, to tackle climate change. This kind of approach is actually spread into other issues than climate change. For instance, the uh, big, big pension fund of Norwegian government started to in integrate plastic issue into uh, the, the investment policy. And also United Nations Environmental Program and others, uh, UN and uh, investors supported by the UK and the Swiss government. Uh, now the nature uh, related Financial disclosure on the business, uh, you know, the started it, it now working. And so the uh, I, uh, this kind of approach is uh, expanding because uh, maybe you can see that investors, related, you know, concern is now climate change, but now move on the plastic and uh, also circular economy, of course, the diversity and other social issues. Last, very last, not least. This kind of uh, decarbonization move might have international relations. That's very important, uh, interesting because Japan and the European, European Union uh, depend on the significantly on the imported fossil fuel. Decarbonization of our energy system uh, rather improve our, uh, you know, the, our energy security. And uh, already US and China and also Brazil uh, uh, you know, quite strong in the energy security, but then maybe they, their status have not maybe uh, very much affected. But uh, some, you know, the company the countries depending on export and the fossil fuel might have some difficulty and less hegemony in the international relations. So decarbonization and the energy transition related to this decarbonization might change the landscape of international relations. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takamura, uh, from re for bringing a perspective from a developed nation as well as for introducing the private sector to the discussion. Once again, we encourage the public to send us questions to the Slido platform. Now, to contribute with a certain point of view, we invite Professor Dr. Viola from the University of Brasilia to the floor. He is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Sao Paulo, as well as the chair of the Brazilian Research Network on the International System in the Anthropocene and Climate Change. He has published several books and more than 80 art articles on issues of globalization and governance, democratization in South America, environmental policy in Brazil, and global and South American politics of climate change. Professor Viola has been a consultant with the Brazilian Ministries of Science and Technology, Education, Strategic Matters, Defense and Environment, and as well as several philanthropic organizations, international agencies, and private corporations. He has been a member of the Scientific Steering Committee of the Human Dimension and Global Environment Change Program in Bonn, Germany, and the Committee of Glo on Global Environmental Change in the Brazilian Academy of Science. Professor, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate very much the invitation by the Fundación Getúlio Vargas um, to, to speak uh, tonight. I appreciate very much to be with Professor Takamura that uh, 
I, I, the presentation was excellent. My presentation uh, will be uh, complementary uh, to her presentation. I have two parts, two parts in my presentation. Uh, the first part has three points and the second part, six points. So starting for, with the first point, uh, I consider that humanity has failed so, so, uh, so far in building up collective action for um, mitigating climate change. Why? Because since the Rio Convention in 1992 and the Kyoto Protocol, the carbon emissions have been increasing continuously, except in last year or uh, uh, more one the, uh, the year of 2009 because of the economic crisis. But otherwise, continuous growing in carbon emissions. And actually, carbon emissions in the first decade of the 21st century were higher than in the uh, 90s, that were the period in which they, we have uh, three important companies, Rio, Kyoto, and Copenhagen. Um, so uh, because of this, uh, because of the, this failure don't necessary, necessarily implies that we will continue failing, but the effort that will be needed for um, success is right now much, much more, uh, is, need to be more deep, more intense, okay? And uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's open-ended what will happen. Second point, the Paris Agreement. My assessment of the Paris Agreement, that is, there are a lot of people that think that, like me, is that was a great diplomatic achievement, but was poor from a substantial point of view of climate change mitigation. But of course, better than the better than Paris Agreement than nothing, okay? Uh, so why was the great diplomatic achievement? Because it was a really very complex negotiation to have the support of all the members of the United Nations. Is because it was a very, very complex negotiation. And for sure, it was very important, the, the leadership of the, the European Union, the, the, uh, the French government, uh, the American government, uh, British government, uh, Japanese government, okay? There were many governments that contributed to the, uh, the great achievement. But the substantial is uh, a kind of reduction of ambition compared with the ambition in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, the model was that there will be a negotiation with based in rationality, let's say, for goals of reduction emissions from uh, all countries, okay? Uh, but this failed, okay? Uh, there was just uh, the, the countries defined their commitments uh, in the Copenhagen, Copenhagen ag uh, agreement uh, signed, uh, finished three months after the conference of Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so what was expected before the, uh, the failure of Copenhagen was uh, a negotiation like in Kyoto, but with more ambitious uh, goals for developed countries and with more um, with some, with goals also for developing countries, particularly middle income countries, okay? Um, so not necessarily reduction of emissions, but at least reduction of the curve business as usual, okay? So, and this uh, didn't happen. Uh, 
uh, and this was the in, in again in Paris the there in each country say what uh, what would the compromise but it's not legally binding the uh, quantitative uh, goals of the countries okay it's voluntary eh? so it's very um, weak from a legal point of view even Copenhagen even Kyoto protocol that was a strong a st stronger in relation to developed countries uh, was didn't have teeth okay for example Canada withdraw from the protocol in two, uh, 2011 and didn't suffer any uh, any um, uh, punishment okay uh, so um, so the the this show but what happened the uh, the Paris agreement was the best you can have at that moment okay so this is also very clear um, uh, so uh, since the Paris agreement most countries are not in track for um, fulfillment the goals that they themselves define mm -hmm. the, uh, for example the goals for 2020 uh, so there is always this is a problem of the agreements you have uh, some sometimes you have long-term goals but uh, the short-term or middle-term goals are really poor for example this whole wave of of um, um, of, of uh, commitment for example carbon new china carbon neutral in 2050 okay but the, if you look at the dynamic of the chinese economy uh, uh this is the, the this is not uh, feasible okay so third point uh, the governance of the climate is dri driven by two major players from one side the most po powerful countries uh, from the other side the major global corporations okay uh, from the point of view of the countries the most powerful are the there are two powers two, two two powers for climate change a constructive power and a destructive power a destructive power is the amount of emissions that you generate the constructive power is the effort to uh, mitigate your emissions and be cooperative in the world arena for uh, for uh, uh, reducing global emission mitigating global climate change okay so what are the countries that are um, the powerful in the area of climate that is not the same that the area of security for example okay or even economics okay so they, they are united states the european union china japan united kingdom india Russia, Brazil, and Indonesia. Okay. Uh, beyond that, other countries that are relevant are also the other G20 countries, and what we uh, name right now the new the countries that are not in the G20 but are growing emissions very emissions economy and population very fast. Being Nigeria. Uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. They are not members of the G20. Uh, so, the recent trajectory uh, from the, the G, these powerful countries, we can group in, uh, in two groups relatively good not very good but there is no very good uh, uh, the best is the united kingdom of course the, as uh, professor takamura showed even in the in the proposal of uh, the commitment for 2030 
Second best is the European Union, but there is a major difference in the European Union between the northern, north, northern countries and southern, northern countries that are much very committed, and southern countries and eastern countries that are uh, some of them not committed, huh? like Poland, for example. Uh, um, so, uh, um, the uh, Japan is also having a good uh, uh, trajectory, not, not good, relatively good. And United States also, for example, even during the, during, I mean, the trend of reducing emissions of United States started in 2009 and continues until today. Uh, even with the Trump administration, the reduction continues, but in, in a more slow pace. Uh, there was just one year in, in which emissions stagnated and were not reduced in the, during the Trump administration that was 2019. And the, the countries with bad recent trajectory are China, that is uh, in itself um, spending the whole carbon gap budget of the planet, okay? India, uh, Russia, uh, that is an oil, is an, is an exporter of fossil fuels, uh, Brazil, that after the, I will talk again afterwards, but in the last, uh, since 2015, uh, has been increasing emissions significantly, and particularly in the last two years, and uh, Indonesia, okay? Well, uh, in relation to corporations, to, uh, to what is very, very relevant is something that has already mentioned by Professor Takamura, that is that in the last two, three years, there has been a shift in global, in most global corporations in the Western world. Not only Western political, not geographical, meaning United States, Canada, Europe, Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, Taiwan, and Australia. Okay, and so uh, the idea they internalized climate risk in their decision making and planning, and the same happened with major investment funds and pension funds in the world. This invest in uh, in corporations that have carbon stranded assets. Fourth point: trajectory of emissions in Brazil. Four periods. 1990-2004, very negative. 2005 to 2012, amazingly positive. Uh, reduction of emission of 70%, okay? But because the, period, the previous period was extremely irrational, the most irrational likely in world history because it was uh, coming from deforestation in the Andes. Uh, not like... Uh, producing jobs and GDP like the thermal power power in China, some things like this. 2013, 2014, a period of stagnation, and 2015, 2020, negative again, very negative the last two years. Fifth point, Brazil, um, this is all the next points are, are related to the role of Brazil in global climate governance. So there is a period of relatively constructive approach to global climate governance that goes from 2000, so from 1990 to 2002. Uh, but relative because at this, there is a major gap between discourse and behavior. So the position, the standing position in the climate, in the international negotiation is positive. But the trajectory of emissions is very negative. Okay, so the credibility of Brazil is very low, eh? and is considered a kind of villain of global crime, of global environment, and this period. Uh, the other thing that is a problem from Brazil, from this point of view, was uh, to have a radical interpretation of the principle principle of common but differentiated re responsibilities, according to which 
only developed country has uh, targets for reducing emission, not middle-income countries, and even not uh, in a more soft way, like, for example, uh, uh, reducing the trajectory of the emissions curve. Uh, um, okay, and the other uh, the other uh, caveat in relation to this relative constructive role is that Brazil, in the negotiation of Kyoto, uh, was opposed to including the emissions uh, coming from forest in the protocol. It, it was uh, partially defeated. Okay. Well, six point. Brazil has a very constructive approach to global climate governance during in the period 2008 to 2010. Huh? Okay, uh, quan, uh, for example, Brazil was the only non-annex one country that had um, quantity um, goals for the Conference of Copenhagen. Though they were very, I mean, tricky because it was based in the deforestation, in the reduction of deforestation that was already going on. So it was something that was and was easy. Okay, uh, so this is this is a caveat. Eh? And uh, there were positions amazing, like the discourse of Lula in Copenhagen, saying that what uh, that not just developed countries should uh, support financially. Uh, poor countries, but also middle-income countries like Brazil should support uh, poor countries. This was something, out, an outlayer position of Brazil. It was not at all supported by the mini Itamaraty, the Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's, it's important to consider that this process of, of uh, dramatic reduction of emission uh, um, was the most important factor probably was the uh, strong leadership of Minister of the Environment and Environmentalist Marina Silva, okay, uh, that Lula supported in 2004. Uh, okay, seven point. Brazil had a very construct, very constructive role at Paris, uh, not immediately before, but. For reasons very complex to explain right now, the president decided, Dilma Rousseff, because he was threatened by impeachment, to have more prestige internationally and uh, accepted more ambitious commitments that were absolute commitments, not anymore relative to, eh? uh, but uh, but uh, to, to, to business as usual, but absolute commitment. Uh, um, and um, generally, the Minister of the Environment in the in the COPs between 2014 and 18 have uh, progressive positions. The eight point Brazil has a very negative role in global climate governance since 2019. Yeah? Became an ally of the more Trump administration, Saudi Arabia, and uh, I mean uh, even uh, having a president that denied the existence of climate change, uh, though even threatened to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, but finally didn't withdraw because there was a lot of opposition. Okay, so future perspective, nine point, the last one. I um, I, I, I think I, um, I am skeptical about the possibility of a significant change in the international and domestic environmental policy of the Bolsonaro administration. Hmm? The core of Bolsonaro is, is, uh, uh, is, de is denial of climate change, is committed to conspiracy theories, uh, commi committed to uh, frequent lies uh, in the public arena. So uh, there will be the European Union is pressuring since 2019, the Bolsonaro administration. And now we will have some pressure of the Biden administration. By that, I don't, so the Biden administration will, will, will not, in my view, confront the Bolsonaro administration, but they will engage 
the subnational governments of Brazil in relation to climate change and the civil society and ONGs and social movements. Okay, so this will could be very effective, but at the same time, not confronting uh, uh, the government, the federal government, because of for for the United States is key Brazil to keep us an allied with the United States, okay? And the, otherwise, with the increasing influence of China in, in South America and in Argentina, particularly, uh, the, the, for, for the Biden administration and the US national interest is key not uh, to avoid pushing Brazil toward China. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Viola. It is a huge opportunity to be able to hear from you, as well as Professor Takamura. We don't have much time left, left. Um, so I will take one question, uh, and we would like, if possible, to hear from both of you professors. The question is, um, Brazil and Japan have received the Fossil Award in COP25 and have been evaluated as reluctant to engage in environmental policy and climate change negotiations. In what aspects of climate change governance can Brazil and Japan work together? And in addition, how can the Japanese government promote renewable energy projects such as wind and solar power in Brazil for business for the business sector? Is it okay? Yes. Um, so I, I then I tackle first and uh, I, I give the button to the Professor Viola, I think, to the park. <laughs> so uh, th thank you very much. Uh, you know, the uh, especially Professor Viola, I, I got a lot of knowledge about the, how the uh, Brazilian position in the international climate governance developed. So it's quite, uh, you know, I had a quite, uh, you know, clear view on that. Thank you very much. So the in the response to the question posed by the audience, I think the Luana presented. It's quite a lot of <laughs> issues, I think. But uh, uh, I think the uh, oh yes, it is. Uh, it is true that at COP twenty five. Japan, I didn't know that Brazil also, but uh, Japan had actually awarded as a fossil fuel award uh, by the civil society. I think mainly uh, because of the, the coal-fired plant policy, domestic, I mean, in Japan and overseas assistance. So uh, that's actually quite changed last year. Uh, in, ter in terms of Japan, because the Japanese government changed its direction in terms of the overseas assistance uh, in the energy sector. So that uh, um, not, uh, unfortunately, maybe not for the uh, uh, project coal fired plant uh, in the pipeline, I mean, it, which was already, you know, the uh, decided uh, to, uh, uh, you know, give some assistance, but uh, um, I think that the, the practical, practically speaking, no new uh, construction project of coal fire plant could, could not be assisted by Japanese government because already Japanese business and also bank are, are getting away from the co new coal fire plant project. Uh, the maybe main more important, uh, you know, the uh, challenge for us is that how to reduce domestic dependence, uh, uh, dependency on the coal fire plant in the, our power sector. Uh, we are now considering the how to strengthen the, the uh, major, I mean, also the how to uh, raise the, our level of ambition, I mean, level of reduction towards 2030. I hope that the some more uh, aggressive action to reduce dependency on the coal fire plant domestically. I think that kind of action hopefully come uh, from these uh, deliberation uh, currently ongoing. 
Um, that's a second uh, point that I like to say that the, what is the possibility of for the collaboration between the Japan and Brazil and especially maybe the renewable. I think now I understand that already now the Japanese business sector uh, go to Brazil as well, and they also to invest in the renewable energy project. Um, I, I think it's a private-private co co partnership and collaboration is ongoing and I hope that the, uh, in light of the increasing energy, uh, uh, clean energy shift in the global market, I think this kind of trend will be strengthening. Um, also, the uh, I know that Brazil, you know, the, uh, you know, actually the benefit of, uh, how to say it, Brazil have a quite a plenty of the potential of renewable domestically. So that's the I, I think it, this is clearly the, the one of the area for the collaboration between the the uh, two governments. I hope, and as uh, Professor Biola mentioned, that uh, maybe not only between the national government but also between the sub national government and. Uh, Japanese uh, uh, government and corporation corp companies. Um, how to then the uh, very uh, briefly the how to uh, you know the increase our renewable portfolio domestically in Japan is uh, we have now the feed-in tariff scheme and uh, to uh, move uh, to to evolve into the feed-in premium some kind of you know assisting. Uh, renewable introduction uh, in our power uh, system is now uh, on, but uh, I, I think the more or, or aggressive action by company uh, actually supported this trend, and uh, hopefully this uh, we could increase the share of renewable toward 2030 and then 2050. Uh, I hope I, I hope I, I, I answer all, all, almost all question, but I think. The uh, Professor Viola could, uh, and you know, they assist me to respond into these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Takamura. We are heading to the end of our event. We will now listen to Professor Eduardo Viola, and then we will I will present the closing remarks. Professor Viola, your mic isn't on. I agree with you, Professor Takamura. Uh, and if we the Brazil uh, winning the prize of fossil of the year, I mean, it's very easy <laughs> considering what was the what is the position of the Bolsonaro administration in the international conferences. Okay, but this something relevant to consider is the following: the dynamic in the Amazon is very negative. Uh, the discourse of Bolsonaro since the electoral campaign has been in favor of supporting illegal mining, illegal uh, uh, timber industry, uh, uh, illegal, def illegal deforestation. And there is a lot of, uh, in here we have very backward um, landowners combined with organized crime. This is what happened in the Amazon. And uh, But this is a base, electoral base of Bolsonaro, okay? So um, the, the best way to, to change this is supporting many state and municipal governments in the Amazon that uh, don't share the Bolsonaro position. Some governors share the Bolsonaro position in the Amazon, but others no. Okay, are, are, and they are in favor of of uh, uh, controlling deforestation. But uh, the resources they have are very limited because generally the resources for control deforestation are federal and, and from the Minister of the Environment, the, the national government. So uh, international uh, funding from Japan, uh, from Europe and United States, I, I, I recognize this. This will be not in big scale because Brazil is a middle-income country, not a not a poor country, and uh, 
and uh, uh, doesn't deserve a major foreign aid, uh, even because we have here a very un unequal society, one of the more unequal in the world. In Gini index today is 0 0.56, and uh, uh, and so and one thing that will be crucial in Brazil for uh, improving the um, uh, the situation in the Amazon, that is the one of the poorest uh, regions of the country, would be to um, to have a uh, tax reform that increase taxation in large corporations and rich people. Okay, uh, so um, I mean, doesn't there is no reason for um, developed countries to pay for uh, something that is that should be uh, done by the uh, uh, Brazilians that are uh, very high income, very high assets, okay? And so um, the other thing that I, I would like to, uh, to add is that, I don't know, Professor Takamura, how is Japan going in the direction of mixing ethanol with gasoline and this because this would be a possibility brazil is a very competitive producer of ethanol uh, from sugar cane um, it's not true that uh, producing more ethanol will increase deforestation uh, it's, this is not, not true uh, it could but it's not necessarily happening like this because there are a lot of of lands that are uh, abandoned in the uh, outside the Amazon, okay, and um, so if Japan is moving in that direction, I don't know because more recently there has been mo major uh, automobile corporations have decided to abandon the uh, combustion engine and move to electric cars, and and so maybe the, there is so the the life of ethanol will be a transitional life, not very long, I mean, unfortunately for Brazil. Though uh, the, what is important is that Brazil could produce significant amounts of uh, green hydrogen that the Europeans are very interested right now. Okay, So this would be another possibility of exportation uh, uh, to Japan. <laughs> Maybe just uh, quickly, if it's okay, Luana? Of course, please. Yeah, I, I, I think, the, th thank you very much, Professor Viola. I think I clearly forget it mentioning that. I mean, the uh, this, you know, the biomass-based fuel, uh, like I don't know, uh, I, I think it, maybe not directly using the vehicle, but uh, I think still the, for instance, in Japan, uh, try to uh, find a collaboration with the Brazil in the field of material, like uh, some kind of replacing the plastic, oil-based plastic, and also the aviation fuel, because it's not easy to you know uh, change the, the uh, you know uh, to power. So that I think that is clearly important area that the collaboration in for toward the decarbonization between Brazil and Japan. I think. It's really wonderful uh, remarks. I really forget. I'm sorry for that. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. And now we approach the end of our panel. Once again, we would like to thank both, both professors for such a unique and informing panel. And I wish our audience a good night. Thank you very much.